it's a, it, I decided to make the most grandiose title I could like possibly come up with. We're very important here. Um, okay. So um, yeah, I'm Ken, if you haven't met me. Um, I mean, I haven't seen any people in years, right, in person. So um, I've been working on Beam since like before it was Beam, uh, about seven years and change. Um, and I'm the PMC chair, like you mentioned, and just so people know what that means, that means once a quarter, I have to like write a report to the, the Software Foundation about what the project's doing and kind of how it's going. Um, I'm also like the tech lead at Google of the people working on Beam. So I spend like a ton of my time just talking to people and writing and thinking about like where Beam's at and where it's going. And so that's sort of my value add in terms of being able to give a talk. Um, but before I get to that, um, I kind of, I want to I pause. I always like to do this. Um, I, I've dreamed of working full time on open source since I was young. And so here I am, it's like my dream come true. So thank you all for, for being a part of that. It's, it's amazing. Um, yeah. Hey, thank you. Okay. So, so yeah, I'll get into it. Uh, Beam is a very philosophical project. We have like a lot of strong opinions uh, historically and we sort of stick to them. Um, for better or worse, for better. Um, and, you know, because of how Beam works, you know, we're trying to build this, this processing model that you can execute on different engines. Um, we always focus on fundamental concepts um, and we don't really have a lot of operational details uh, in the APIs um, because we can't, right? Um, and so I think because of this, we've come up with a lot of really novel ideas. Um, and Obviously, all the other frameworks have great ideas too, um, and Beam runs on all these engines, which are made by very brilliant people. Um, but the ideas that come from Beam, I think, are pretty unique um, because of the nature of the project. So I'm just going to sort of go through a little bit of history, which some of it was covered in Pablo's talk. So, but this will be like my take on it, um, and then go into the present, which will be my take on the contents of Harry's talk a little bit. It's sort of a you're going to get Beam from every direction. Um, so uh, to start, I'm going to go like way, way, way back in time to the ye old days of 2010. Um, so uh, to Flume Java, which which is like a sort of a turning point for me. I feel like it represents um, the beginning of the next generation of data processing, at least in my head. Um, because in 2004, Google published the MapReduce paper. In 2005, Hadoop implemented it. Um, and then everybody started writing all their map reduces, but you needed a bunch in a row, right, to do your data processing. Um, and you'd use something like cascading or airflow. There was no airflow, but like you would use something along those lines to coordinate them. Um, and it ended up being like really inefficient or, or you'd have to break modularity and just like move code between different unrelated uh, segments of your program. Um, so Flume Java was Google's sort of solution to this. And what they did was they took stuff that functional programmers had been sort of working out um, in the sort of 70s through 90s um, and just applied it to, to the big data computation because um, MapReduce itself was based on functional programming. Um, and, and yeah, and it allowed you to sort of shuffle less data, have fewer shuffles, uh, just sort of maintain modularity and write much larger uh, data processing pipelines. So for context, um, at the time, the Spark paper also came out in 2010, like the very first Spark paper, and it was sort of focused on iterative and interactive uh, querying. So at that time, Spark didn't have a shuffle implementation, for example. So that's kind of where data processing was at. Um, Flink didn't exist for a number of years. Um, and yeah, so, so they weren't really comparable systems back then. And I highlight this because this is now table stakes, right? Every single system, like nobody's like, wow, you fused together a bunch of like element-wise computation. Uh, no, everybody expects you to do that. Um, and so this is kind of an early example of focusing on a fundamental idea and it just becoming what everybody does. So this, is, I mean, this is like not a very modest uh, talk. Um, to be clear, I didn't do most of this, right? I'm, I'm immodest on other people's behalf. So 2013, uh, the Mill Will paper came out. Um, and that was sort of, everybody had been processing time series kind of forever, but it was Google's take on time series processing at Google scale. Um, and interestingly, the Mill Wheel paper does not have this diagram in it, right? It doesn't talk about event time versus processing time because that was not a thing. Like they just sort of assumed if you have data, it has timestamps, it's a time series. If you're aggregating by hour, you're gonna use those timestamps to do it. Um, 
and it would be great if we had like stuck with that, but batch processing sort of led us astray and people were like, oh, well, I'm going to run a daily job or an hourly job and I'm just going to ignore everything I know about data and distributed systems. I'm just going to say that's, that's okay. I'm just going to use the data that showed up. Um, and I just, it's kind of cliche, but I'm going to say that's not even wrong, right? It's just like you kind of didn't understand the problem. Um, so when Dataflow came out in 2015, we've been like advocating and saying like, no, you really have to aggregate according to the data. And at this point, everybody does it, right? Spark streaming and Kafka streams and Flink, we all sort of understand that, yeah, we have to get back to just, you know, processing to get results according to the data. So this was, theme was a big part of sort of pushing that into the mainstream. Um, yeah, another aspect of the Dataflow launch, um, and this is around 2015, um, was of course the unified model, which we still harp on a lot. Um, I'm just saying like there's actually this set of primitives where you can you can do streaming and batch using the same set of primitives. So you only have one set of concepts you need to learn. Um, and I pictured here, right, there's like do the same thing to every piece of data, and then there's like group the elements according to some, some key, right? And there's a third one, which is like taking a piece of work and splitting it, All right? That's the sort of, there's, there's one other one, but um, I guess uh, at the same time you had, you did have um, Stratosphere and Flink out there, like that was, and they were touting a unified engine, but they had like sort of different models for executing batch and streaming, but they could use the same underlying engine. Um, so it's kind of an interesting time. Spark streaming at the time was not really viable. Um, so most stream processing was happening on previous generation stuff like Storm and Samza, um, I think Heron, I believe was was going strong at the time. So Dataflow's thesis was that streaming and batch processing kind of can be unified. Um, my thesis now is that they have to be, right? And the reason I say this is like, even if you are doing a nightly batch job, that's an implementation detail of the continuous operation of your business, right? You actually have data coming in every day, right? Constantly, and you're gathering it and you're processing it once a day because that's maybe like your technological capability at the time, or maybe it's cost effective. Um, so, so streaming is kind of like the natural endpoint of batch processing. Um, and conversely, if you're doing a stream, so you've got like some streaming application, um, you're gonna have bugs. And depending on how much you care about correct results, you're gonna like fix the bugs, you're gonna reprocess old data, you're gonna wanna run experiments on data, and you don't have 24 hours to process 24 hours of data. So you actually need to take your exact same logic, run it in a batch mode, um, and take advantage of sort of the optimizations that are available to batch. Um, so we can see now, I guess I wanna just say like, this thesis also kind of worked out. Like everybody's kind of converging on these primitive operations uh, for the most part, right? There's not a million ways to do embarrassingly parallel big data. Um, and you know, some systems to varying degrees, they expose their operational details. So they have slightly different ideas of like what's a primitive operation. Um, but this is you know, proven out pretty well. Okay, then uh, the next idea is the sort of the foundation of Beam itself, which is that since these are the fundamental operations, any viable system can use can run them, right? You're, you've implemented them whether or not you know it. So this is where I get to start sticking logos on the slides, right? So it started with Dataflow, Spark, and Flink, um, right at the, the inauguration of Beam, or at the beginning of incubation, I should say. Um, I don't remember if the SAMHSA runner came in before or after incubation. Um, somebody will have to point that out to me uh, afterwards. But but yeah, so everything everything up here, like we've got Nemo, Hazelcast, Jet, um, even systems we never expected like Twister 2. Um, all these systems either have a beam runner or somebody's working on a beam runner or sort of figured out how to write a beam runner for it, right? Um, it's just the, the the wide world of data, big data processing, right? Some are lower level, like I think I would say Ray and Sam's are sort of more like frameworks where you can then uh, build these primitives out of them. Um, some are higher level to give you something like flat map, whereas Beam has this Swiss Army knife Pardue, which for better or worse. Um, but yeah, so you can run Beam in all sorts of contexts and that that's really proven very useful. Um, the next thing that comes from Beam um, and you all know this by this point probably, but is that we have this language agnostic portability model, right? Most of the runners uh, in the early days are based on Java, although Cloud Dataflow never was fully Java based. Um, uh, but of course, programmers are in lots of languages and every language is a community and an ecosystem. And depending on your discipline, uh, you might 
just sort of gravitate or you happen to exist in one or another um, and you need to use certain libraries to get your job done. Um, so, you know, if you have a runner in Java, you want to execute some Python code, right? There's not a million ways to do it. There's, there's a few special cases for like some language interactions, but basically you're going to have a couple processes talking to each other, right? That's, that's what you're going to come down to as you try to generalize. Um, so PySpark, PyFlink, they, they did this, right? They said, okay, we're, we're going to let people have Py, Python and we're going to just open, start up a process and talk to it and get it to run the Python code that's in their pipeline. Um, but what Beam did here, which is new, and what we focus on is that it's, we're, the portability framework is not about like, oh, now you can have Python. The portability framework is like, all the languages work this way. This is what a pipeline is. Java, every language is on equal footing. Right? And by doing that, we kind of came up with a more general and a more efficient protocol where we, it, and it's, it's so efficient that right now PyFlink has actually adopted the protocol part of Beam, right? So this idea is getting out there where you, you take a subset of a segment of your graph and you sort of fuse it together and you send it over to the thing that's going to run the Python code. Um, and we know that Beam Python is running in production on SAMSA, on Flink, on Cloud Dataflow. So um, it's been totally proved out, right? This is not a question mark at all anymore. Um, but the other thing that comes from this uh, is that this makes the idea of having multiple languages in a pipeline normal, right? That's something that nobody else really does um, in the way that Beam does. So you have all of your Java connectors to every storage system in the world just sort of available for Python to go. Uh, you have Python's ML engineering ecosystem uh, becoming available to these other languages. Um, and I love um, this example, which people have mentioned a few times of this hackathon we had at the, the beginning of the year, which completely proved how amazing this separation of concerns is, where six engineers, which admittedly involved like <laughs> some superstars, um, but just put together a working TypeScript SDK in a week, which, um, you know, it shows that you leverage the fact that you can use all these Java connectors and these runners that are implemented in different languages. Um, Another, oh, I also want to mention that the other thing is once you have multiple languages in the same pipeline, that brings the idea of like, oh, well, you can also have multiple variations, right? You can have custom containers where you've got different dependencies loaded for different segments of your pipeline. So it's actually um, a total paradigm shift. It's not, it's not at all comparable um, to how other frameworks are doing uh, language portability. Okay, so... Um, from here, we have like, we're thriving on like lots of runners, lots of languages, we're mixing them up. Um, and this isn't in chronological order, um, but I'm, I wanna talk about then like raising it to a higher level, right? You might be, you wanna use more convenient high level things like SQL, data frames. Um, and basically you, you wanna adopt, um, I'm gonna say structured data and familiar forms of data processing um, for usability at, at first, but you still want the Beams unified model and so I got together with folks in like the CalSite and the Flink community, um, and we actually we got a paper about it um, where we say all you need for streaming SQL is you just take SQL and you stick Beam streaming concepts on it, um, and and so that's being discussed now in like SQL standardization. Maybe someday it'll be standardized, um, but for now that's what Flink SQL and Beam SQL um, and CalSite all do. That's pretty similar, and I think I think K SQL also has pretty similar concepts. Um, and conversely, like Beam can learn from the structured data processing, right? We're working on vectorized computation, right? Operating on columnar batches of data is super efficient um, compared to element-wise. And this is kind of a change from the early days of Beam, we assumed data was just a bunch of opaque blobs of bytes you couldn't understand, um, which doesn't really describe data typically. Um, and so knowing that it's structured lets you do like novel optimizations and execution strategies. Um, and this is an area where Beam's learning from others, which, you know, and I, I would say that like Spark's Catalyst is an incredible example of, of leveraging this. Um, but incorporating this into Beam's portability model um, is something that hasn't really been done before. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about where that leads. Um, okay, so all this, this previous stuff I've been highlighting, you've probably heard a lot before. Um, you don't hear about this one quite as much, um, although people who work on Beam and, and I.O. connectors have, have encountered it, right? Beam has source APIs that are unlike anybody else's, right? We know that there's this primitive thing. You have work, you need to split it up so you can parallelize it, right? Um, and everybody has, a, has something like that, but as you scale up, that splitting decision you made 
is going to be wrong, right? You're not actually going to have split the data into equal uh, se segments of work. Um, so what you need to do in order to achieve like the efficiency that you'd like is you need to be able to notice stragglers. You need to be able to like cut off the work that they're doing, split it again, and redistribute it across workers. Um, and Beam has this dynamic splitting capability just built into its source APIs. It's always had this, right? And this, it, the bigger you, your pipeline gets, the more of a difference it makes in your end-to-end -end runtime, where if you have like a cluster that's like always up, then that's your cost, right? You can save like 25% um, by having this dynamic splitting in this the example I've thrown here on the slide. Um, there's a great talk by, um, by Malo uh, a few years ago called No Shard Left Behind, all about this, right? So this is something where I think Beam has a lot to teach. Um, other frameworks that haven't adopted it yet. Um, the next thing is we also took this source API and we said, and most of the time, like you're reading data, so it's at the top of your pipeline or the start, right? You say, I'm gonna read some data and do some stuff, write out the result. Um, and, and in Beam, there's this big push for a thing we call splittable do fun, which is, I just love that we have that piece of jargon. Um, but it's, uh, right, you said, actually, you can split any work, right? You don't, it doesn't have to be the first thing in the pipeline. It can just be like, I have an element, I want to process it, but that's a lot of work, and I know how to split it up, and you can do that. Um, and at first, it might have seemed like an academic exercise where you're like, ah, I found out another thing I could unify, uh, but <laughs> it's, that's not it, right? This is super normal. Like, maybe you've got a topic, and you're like, send somebody is... I don't know, it's watching, somebody's watching for new files that show up in a blob store, they're sending them over a topic, something else is listening to the topic and you wanna read the files. And you have a bunch of steps in your pipeline where you have like this very large relationship between like element comes in and there's a bunch of work you have to do and maybe you produce a ton of output um, from the specification of thing you wanna read. Um, it's super easy to come up with combinations of batch and streaming style sources where you, you mix and match them and you come up with a very elementary use case that needs this sort of most advanced um, sort of API for authoring connectors. So since we have this awesome API for authoring connectors, Beam is the best place to put them. I, you know, I think if you have a storage system, you should write a Beam connector, right? Um, we right now have about 50, I think. I kind of count them up, give or take. Um, maybe it's maybe a little lo less, maybe a little more, depends on how you count them. Because um, a lot of them have a bunch of variations for, you know, you can read from Spanner or you can read a chain stream from Spanner and, and stuff like that. You can read the files or you can watch for uh, changes to the files. Um, you can write to BigQuery by a bunch of imports. You can write to BigQuery via the storage API. And these connectors are very different. Um, but so let's say we got about 50. They're all on the slide here. I'm not going to write them off. Um, I found all the, all the logos I could. This is... I put a lot of very valuable time into this. Um, and this year, I think we've got, like, new ones. Um, like the Pulsar, Firestore, and Debezium connectors are new, and there's new variations on Elasticsearch and BigQuery. Um, and we're also connecting to like new connector ecosystems because our API can absorb um, other people's API, like APIs because it's so advanced, right? Um, like CDAP and Hadoop input format um, both provide like a bunch of different connectors that we can utilize. So where Beam's going here is like 50 sounds like a lot, but it's not, right? There's actually like a million things where you want convenient access. You just want it in your pipeline. They don't all have to be like super high, high volume, like crazy storage systems, but you just want to connect to wherever your data is. And so we've got this thing going on in Beam where we're authoring documents on IO standards, right? How to like test them, what the API should look like, uh, what the documentation and the scale story should be in order for it to be like a quality maintainable connector. And that's going to help us scale up because we're going to need hundreds. Um, and that's, that's where I think we're going. Um, and, and, and to be clear, I, I haven't seen this elsewhere. You know, I don't know that other, this is a place where I think Beam is leading. Like this is an idea which I think has a huge potential to help people um, and to grow the community um, and connect a lot more data. Um, in the same vein, um, Beam's a perfect place for AI and ML engineering, right? Because again, you have a bunch of zillions of frameworks that you might use in your ML engineering, right? And of course, big data, the whole reason we are collecting all this data pretty much is to do machine learning. Like that's whatever, a third of the talks here so far uh, have touched on this. Um, 
And so Beam is also pushing not just like integrations with all of these, but sort of like higher level wrappers, right? Like the run inference transform that's being uh, described here, um, where you integrate with like scikit-learn or PyTorch, and then when you take the adapter and you put it into Beam, we have the best practices for how to actually execute uh, inference um, in a Beam way. And the best practices are encoded as a transform that's reusable, right? It, um, and so that, that level of indirection, it, like, it's in the spirit of saying like, okay, we're gonna get these like fundamental best practices and we're gonna make it so you can change your mind later or whatever. Um, some of the other, some of these on the slide are aspirational, but these are all things that have been mentioned in a talk or talk description or there is code for. Um, I'm not gonna name them for, for time. So, so far I've been talking about stuff that would actually be like committed to the Beam repository, um, right? Things that are part of Beam, but Beam was, exists like within an ecosystem and that's like a super good thing, right? Not everything should be released every six weeks as a library, right? There's, there's lots of different kinds of projects out there um, and the more things that integrate with it outside of Beam, Right, the more likely you're going to be able to grab the stuff you need and, and accumulate it into um, like a solution for your problem. This is not exactly novel. It's not like we're leading the, in the industry in the idea of having an ecosystem, but I think it's like it's a change. You know, it's it's different from the early days of Beam, and I just want to note that this is where we are right now. This is sort of what's what's happening. What I see happening, um, and um, yeah, and targeting Beam is is great, right? Because if you are you know, you connect um, your framework with Beam in some way, um, then you're multiplying your impact by the number of connectors and engines um, and utility libraries that are available. All right, so I've sprinkled my my predictions throughout, you know, like where I see Beam sort of heading. Um, and it's pretty obvious, right? I think, number one, the ML engineering, uh, the AI capabilities are gonna explode. Um, I didn't. I forgot to highlight that a couple Python native engines are sort of coming around. I hope they do adopt the portability framework, but it's going to be a much easier on ramp for people in a Python ecosystem. Um, I think that the TypeScript SDK it's going to get some users. I would love to see one or two additional language communities integrated. I think now that we know how easy it is to create out an SDK, we should see that happen. Um, we're going to see the core model of Beam take advantage of structured data. Um, right, and see import improvements in port of, like performance and usability based on that. Um, we're going to see the connector ecosystem multiplied, let's say 2x, maybe 5x. Um, yeah, and the, then I think the getting started story, which I didn't talk about with like Beam Notebooks, Interactive Beam, Beam Playground, it's just getting easier and easier to sort of get started with Beam and then sort of filling in the gaps to the point where you're running at moderate scale uh, to running at large scale. OK, so that's thank you. I think the future is bright. I think Beam has sort of made this interesting transition from the early days of addressing fundamental problems to, um, to really focusing less on fundamental sort of data processing and mathematical problems to focusing on these interesting ecosystem problems. And like, what's the next step now that we've got like the the core uh, really nailed.